What's up everyone, Matthew and Sina here, and in today's episode, I had a chance to interview Nydia Diaz on her beautiful work and the amazing process behind it. Nydia is a freelance art director and designer based out of Porto, Portugal, and as an art director, she leads teams of designers to determine the visual direction of her projects. Her work is focused mainly on designing style frames for motion design projects. And for those of you who don't know, style frames are simply rendered 2D or 3D still images that determine the look of a motion design piece. Now let's get into it by looking at her project for Microsoft Office 365. What was this project and what was the goal of this project? So, Microsoft, so at this time last year, I was working at Tendril in Toronto and uh, Microsoft approached us to help them um, share Microsoft 365. So everyone uses Office, um, and not everyone, but like the majority of populations uses Office, uh, and they were going for this redesign. So Microsoft has, um, has been in the last years uh, having this thing called Fluent Design, mm -hmm. which is kind of similar to like Google Material, where they create their own, like trying to really uh, make everything that, make sure that everything looks the same. So mm -hmm. they were doing that to the whole uh, uh, Word Office, everything within the Office thing, not only the icons, but also like inside the app, like uh, the small icons there, the, how mm. the height of the things are and stuff like that. So they wanted to make a video that showcased, hey, we are revamping uh, Office, but it's still the same as you know it. So if you've been using it for a lot of years and you're a power user, you still have all those functions, but we just kind of tied things up a little bit. Uh, so they wanted to have, like, they come to us and ask us for, like, a few, few different options in terms of treatment. Uh, and we end up combining, like, the live action with the 3D. Uh, mm. So we, we wanted to give the human touch. We didn't want to be just, like, here's all the UI. Because then we could just record a video <laughs> of, like, here's how you use Office. So we wanted to be, like, going between, like, um, live action um, and then having, like, moments where we show the, the new logos uh, for Word and all the stuff that they're designing, and then all the functionalities that were new, like um, obviously they wanted to compete with Google, so they have like collaboration now and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So, so a lot of that was uh, was one of the main purpose, and as well like the grid, like this was very important that it came from a design mind uh, set than just here's just Word and we're just putting whatever buttons is there. Um, so here was going from like telling a story of how. Microsoft was evolving, but as well showing all the features that would make it relevant for people to be interested in it. And so, I just wanted to highlight that. I just, I think that's super smart. So, you know, it doesn't matter if it's live action or 2D or 3D here, you're looking for very consistent things to loop them all together. Cause it's all these very tiny details that really add up. And I think uh, it's very easy to overlook these things, but if you're very consistent about, you know, color coding or whatever the design system is across the board, then it becomes a very cohesive and a very tight piece. Uh, yeah, we tried. I mean, it's, it's Microsoft as well, right? So they all have their brand guidelines and stuff like that. So that was something like that I had to go through first as well with like read their guidelines and understand, obviously they have these whole marketing campaigns and understand because as we were doing this as well, they were doing their own, promotional inside to like release it as still. Mm -hmm. So we had to be sure that we were doing like, that it felt part of the same world rather than just completely different things. We did a lot of exploration on this uh, project. We had actually a long uh, design phase for this. So we did a lot of like, this is all of the early studies we did. And this was because there was a very good relation with Microsoft where we would explore different things before we nailed what they really wanted and what we wanted. Uh, so we went from like this very graphical approach. Uh, we're trying like, we always had this idea of the light moving because like making it feel like it's evolving. Uh, mm -hmm. At some point, there was an idea of having each like word and all the stuff being a room and environments. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was a bit harder because there wasn't that much elements that we could put in the scene you know, to make it feel like an actual environment. And then we also had these like icons being made. So there was first it was supposed to be more like clay kind of forming, uh, mm -hmm. constructing with the grid, and then it became uh, just the cubes. Uh, kind of coming in and forming the logo uh, wow. intelligence as well. This was like, um, these ones were done by Twisted Polly. Uh, is this like website name thing? But it's, he was doing like, we're doing like this kind of uh, more like cylindric shapes and then it became again the cubes and then more to different shapes. And this came based on like how they wanted to represent data. So mm -hmm. it was a mix between what Microsoft wanted and what we were trying to push for. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the live action, uh, 
it was great as well. We tried to do a storyboard so we knew exactly what we needed because we had so many interaction points between going from live action to 3D that we had like a list of shots that like, I need a mouse click, I need a typing on the keyboard. So all those <laughs> things like have like a little list so I could like, on the day I was like, check, check. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So as we continued on in this conversation, Nidia shared many more explorations that her and her team exhausted for this project. It was very clear to me that she's the type of person to explore every single direction possible so that they could find the right one. I think it's really important for projects on this scale and magnitude. So that was one of the first tests we're doing is like having these kind of isometric, very clean uh, backdrops, but then having a bit more of this glass. So these glass uh, panels, they are part of the fluent design. They're not glass, they're called acrylic. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're trying to incorporate them. Um, so here was like trying to get this very like clean look on the board, um, trying to like have a different the lines coming in, showing how like everything is supposed to align. So this was very early stage. Uh, and while we we're doing this, they were also still working on the UI. So some things end up changing later on as they were working and doing user testing. Did you design all of these in 3D? Yes, all of these ones are Cinema 4D. Cinema 4D, and what did you use to render it? Uh, Redshift. Redshift, yeah, these are beautiful. Here is the airplanes, because at, at some point we're trying to play with like metaphors of the email gets sent and you're in this 3D world and the airplane would go, but keeping it very like stylized as well so you wouldn't be like crazy world so this was very early explorations they would come to this laptop <laughs> and when i put this grid it was to be like more like the design grid and then someone at work was like oh it looks like a tiles in a bathroom <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so, that up. so that says, person ruined it. ruined it i was like yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no it's so funny i was thinking the same thing i was like oh that looks so gorgeous and then once you said that now i can't unsee that it just looks like bathroom tiles with dirty right? ground <laughs> i know right so, so yeah i thought it was so funny it's like one comment i was like ah i'm taking that off <laughs> but yeah so this was for collaboration this one and one of our early ideas was to have since each user gets assigned a color that mm -hmm. the deck that instead of being like a normal paper as they are collaborating would be like this kind of glass-ish fluent design panel that is organic and then as the person types something on word this would push color into this uh, glass and mm -hmm. they will start bleeding into this gradient so it's like as they collaborate it just gets like more and more into this beautiful gradient so you'll mm -hmm. start very simple with one color of one user and then you start seeing much more colors bleeding out and then mm. it will become this kind of like full paper made of like this kind of different gradients it will be like different users combining into this uh, paper document that they're doing. Um, oh, so, this was, so this was trying to be very metaphoric, but mm -hmm. obviously the problem is that it's still Microsoft and I mean, that's not a problem, but they have their own language. So they felt that this was a bit too um, abstract. Right. Which I knew when I was learning, to be honest, but I always <laughs> like to try it first. <laughs> like, maybe yeah, I'll, maybe I'll go for that. You never know, right? So right. It, it's better to go further and, and exhaust the exploration before you start editing yourself so early, because, you know, if you limit your thinking so early, then, you know, you, you might not run into some very interesting ideas that nobody had thought of. So I just wanted to point it out that this three frame sequence is very beautiful. It has this nice abstract metaphor of flow. And I can, I, I, you know, I, you know, if I'm assigning a story to it, just when I look at these three frames, the way you describe it, it makes me feel like there's all these collaborators and it's all this nice flowy process. And then you reveal it as this uh, single document that, that they've all been working on. So I love this. If I was your creative director, or, you know, somebody who had to pitch this, you'd be, be making my job very, very easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it was like, uh, obviously, like when I, like you said, when I was, I always think that you should definitely push it further when you can at the beginning because there's no point in limiting you uh, as well because sometimes you you may have a misconception about the client thinking oh he's never going to go for this and maybe they're actually more mind open-minded than you think um so i did try and obviously they said uh, they liked it so that's the thing they liked it but they felt that knowing that what they've done in the past as well and making the brand feel uh, easier they felt like oh maybe let's not do that uh so you end up being like this so because they have the panel, they say, hey, can we just have the panels straight, like without being organic? And then maybe they just, as each person collaborates, maybe it's a panel. Uh, so then we change a bit the story and we had, because we always thought about having one computer and the other. And we thought that this would be the perfect moment to transition from one actor 
to the mm -hmm. other because it's mm -hmm. the only it's the first time that they're actually together collaborating. Uh, mm -hmm. So the idea was like to have a camera from one side rotating to the other side of the live action, and in the middle mm -hmm. would be 3D. So she will start typing. You see this movement coming in as a panel, and then you start rotating, and you're you kind of panning through this kind of world of word collaboration with all these panels being text, and then going back to the new user now who are always seeing this girl typing. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the story, it worked really well. Um, so it was like trying to go like, oh, I'm super abstract. So it still kind of has a part of abstract, but it does, we had to put the text in to make more um, understandable because sometimes it's mm -hmm. as well, like if I tell the story, it's on the other one, it's easier to understand. But if people see it for the first time, probably they wouldn't. And here it's more clear, oh, there's text there, there's typing and all the stuff. And then the other ones that we did, yeah. And this is another one I have. So. Wow. This, this one was as well one of the early ones for collaboration and it was based on the concept of the color bleeding. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the creative director from Microsoft asked was to have a symbol per section. So we had a few things that we had to beat like to show like collaboration, uh, speed and stuff like that. So he wanted to create like different uh, symbols for each one. Uh, we ended up taking most of them out because of the length of the story. Uh, but this was the first one that I, one of the, early stages of the collaboration. So it'll be the same where the color bleeds and then with the light and the caustics, you get this kind of like blending of the whole gradient. Oh man, you're speaking my visual language right here. I'm, I'm so in love with this stuff. It's so gorgeous. <laughs> Thanks. One strength that I see in your work and the work that you've showed us so far is that because you work in 3D, because you dabble a little bit here in live action, you have a strong sense of lighting. You have a strong sense of design and uh, strong sense of movement and all of these things overlap and kind of add up to each other in terms of understanding what the final result can look like. So I think over time with experience of you just being able to go out there and pick up a lot of different things, working with a lot of different people, it really shows with a project like this where you get to exercise your full uh, breadth of skills and knowledge and apply it across a very different medium. So kudos to you and I love seeing this work. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. Like, I think the thing, like, I've always been like a, uh, you know, like a jack of all trades, master of none per se, because I like so many different things. Uh, but it does help me when I have to do these things in 3D. Like, I when I was at Hyper, uh, I, uh, one of my colleagues from my my class, he was like really good at photography and filming. So I was like, hey, how can I become better at it? How can I like be good at uh, taking pictures? He just told me you have to buy a camera. You can just read about it. You, you, you need to tr you get the equipment, go out there and try it. Uh, but now it helps because now I can, I know how things work. I know all like, about the right. things and stuff. Like, I mean, I, I don't have a professional course, but I, I read a lot about it. I tried, I bought different lenses. And so I think that like knowing a bit of everything, I think it, it comes really well when you're an art director because you'd have to deal with different people and, and different uh, sectors right so it's, it's good to have that basic understanding at least of what you're asking someone right I, I should know no that's that's totally right if we all speak the same language then it's much easier to communicate and get what you need done and realize the vision and the beautiful thing about i think where our industry is headed in terms of motion design and the tools is that they're getting so similar to each other with all of these uh, amazing 3d renderers that we have out there now octane redshift Arnold, like all of these and the 3D packages that are out there, they're pretty much all the same language. You know what I mean? Just like how the cameras operate, how the lightings work, uh, all, all of the, the, the tools and technical aspects of it are bleeding into each other because it's all based off of physical stuff, real life stuff. So that's awesome that you got a chance to explore with a regular camera because I could see and also from my experience that that applies into the 3D world because if you understand how a real camera works, how real lighting works, and it's very easy to replicate and make something look good or amazing in 3D. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think I think as like you said, as like Redshift and all things, as the software evolves, it, it became more real, right? And and I always tell people like, if you're lighting something, how would you do it in real life? I think it's right. much easier to think that way and trying to think of oh, where I'm going to put the lights and how we do it in real life, and then that <laughs> should help you at least kickstart something. Absolutely. Same thing with camera moves. You know, if you want something to look real, you have to make realistic camera moves. Otherwise, if you have an ultra wide lens that's just flying around, you know, that feels very fake versus what's actually possible. So when I like to animate and design stuff, if the objective is to be more realistic, then I think about 
well, where's the cameraman? Where's the crane? Where's the track? Like, how would this operate in real life so that we can mimic something in real life? And, you know, that's how you get this hyper real look or almost true to life look and, and make it look really premium. In this next project, Nidia walked through a sponsorship opportunity with HP. They commissioned her to create something under the theme of the power to reinvent beauty to help promote their new hardware. Now, I wanted to say this is a great example of how creators can work directly with brands nowadays. This goes to show that if you have a good personal brand and a presence online, companies will find a way to leverage your skills, your stories to help align and achieve their own marketing goals. So HP last year uh, was contacting a few different artists to um, help them extend their like, tell, the, tell these people in our industry that, hey, we do with laptops and desktop um, hardware that we want you guys to be using. So um, they invited me to, to be part of one of those artists to use one of their machines and do an artwork for it, uh, which mm -hmm. is pretty fun. So pretty much it was very open brief and I could do pretty much whatever I want as long as you went within the, um, a theme that they gave to all uh, artists just to make sure that we all <laughs> doing the same, at least have something in common. And the theme was the power to reinvent beauty. Um, so as I was doing this, uh, when I got the, the brief, I was like, this is the final piece. And wow. when, I was, when I was doing it, uh, I was trying to think for me, what is beauty? Um, and, and I realized, I mean, I, I did that from before, but beauty is very different for different people. Mm -hmm. But it's really hard to like do something that to represent beauty because everyone has their own standards of it. Um, so then I started thinking about our industry and all of that. And then I wanted to show how the process beautiful, like how something gets to a point because there's a process behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a few ideas one, and one of them, I, I call it craftsmanship, uh, where I like how, how sometimes people forget about how much goes behind an artwork or something like that. Um, and I do abstract stuff, so it was mixing all the things that I liked into one piece. Uh, so this one, I, my idea was to have this um, block uh, as far as like that, going from like a harsh, rocky side, so the, mm. the left side, and as it goes to the right, uh, to, the, to the top, it becomes much more organic. So I was trying to create this process from like harsh to like, like I was trying to play with contrasts mm -hmm. and having like each person will probably like something more from one side or the other and trying to get this. And I think for me, this was actually harder to do because usually when I do style frames, I do different style frames to tell a story. And mm -hmm. here I only had one image to tell a story. Mm. So it may, it had, I had to think in a different way, right? It's like, it's only one picture and it has to say something. Um, obviously I like doing abstract stuff because it means that people can take their own spin on it and mm -hmm. their own take and what they feel about it. Um, and for me it was like really having this harsh and organic all combined and having this kind of progression between one to the other. Um, so I, what I did is I took pictures of crystals. Um, wow. I always like crystals and I always like anything related with nature. One of the requirements was to use a bit of Adobe software on it because they were mm -hmm. going to present this at Adobe Max last year. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, I love Photoshop. So I thought, hey, I can like take, a, buy some crystals, take pictures and use them as texture and do like a bit of photo bashing. So, I found a store here in Toronto that sells like crystals. So I bought a few of them with different variety and then I took pictures to them. Nothing fancy, it was just like a paper, white paper and direct sunlight. I was trying first to photo batch everything in Photoshop and then I was like, ah, it's gonna take me forever. So <laughs> I went into 3D uh, and I sculpted. I, I started like pretty much the craftsmanship, right? I start with this block and then I start sculpting parts of it. Um, and then I just render it out into different materials and then I mix them in Photoshop. What software did you use to sculpt that? Is that also Cinema 4D? Yes, I'm not very, uh, I, I tried ZBrush before, but then I just still, so I, I always cheat my way in Photoshop afterwards. So. <laughs> right. So yeah, so I went from like rendering it and then laying everything in Photoshop. Wow. And, and then I just add like the photos that I did from the crystals and at one point, I, re I decided to put these branches and, um, and flowers just to give it a bit more connection with nature because it's something that I really like. And because I was having this kind of ice and rocks and bubbles, just felt that it was missing like 
something in there. And so I just keep on adding elements until the point that I said enough is enough. Oh my gosh, I love this. What's super cool about this is I know earlier you said, I'm a jack of all trades, but master of none. I feel like you're actually a master of all when I look at these things and, you know, seeing the final result, which is obviously beautiful, but you utilize all of the layered skills that we were talking about earlier, which is photography, 3D, Photoshop and learning how to combine all those things together where you just do a little bit in each and the final result, you're able to come up with something very, very amazing because you're able to utilize all those skills where I feel like some people who are specialists are kind of stuck in one particular lane. They aren't able to take something all the way to fruition like this to have such a beautiful ending result because people, especially who work in pipelines, they might only work on one part of it and they might not know how to do the rest of this stuff. But for you being able to take this from concept all the way to final delivery and final render and having the result that you have, it's it's a testament to how good your skills actually are, even though you claim you're yeah. a master of none. <laughs> In this next project, Nidia shares her experience doing title design and animation work for the semi-permanent 2018 festival. She played a small part in a larger collaborative effort and her approach changed here and she shares with us how it was different because this time, not only was she designing something, she was also animating it. Let's take a look. So Joyce, amazing uh, director, designer, so she got the chance to work on and direct this opening titles for Sweet Permanent last year. Uh, and as part of that year, Dropbox was one of the sponsors. So they wanted to make it about collaboration. So when she got into the project to say, hey, we wanted to collaborate with other artists to create this uh, final piece. Uh, so uh, Joyce approached me to do one of the parts on the, um, on the Sweet Permanent, which I was very happy. Uh, it was very different as well. And I, that's why I always like to show this or talk about this project because I do stills nowadays, but I had to animate on this one. Uh, which was a good challenge for myself, um, seeing how my rough off those like uh, skills. Um, so we were a big team and I was supposed to be doing the act three. So this was all based on like microscope organisms, which mm -hmm. for me is like, I love all the stuff. So I was like, yes. So what was the goal of um, the visuals here? What was it supposed to uh, communicate for this title sequence? Because you mentioned uh, collaboration, right? Yeah, so this one, um, I think Joyce has a better like um, talking about the, the whole direction because that, that was actually her, her side, but she talked about mm -hmm. this kind of creative tension. So she wanted mm -hmm. to kind of show that creative tension, uh, uh, but she wanted to, the collaboration to be part of like different artists coming together to create this one unified piece. Um, and she, she did an amazing job. She had already like an animatic by the time I talked with her. So it was like, it was, I was very easily sold on the idea. She showed me stuff. Here's animatic, here's idea. And I was like, love it. So this is one of the references that she sent was uh, this one. Um, and yeah, I, I was like blown away. And I did a bit more exploration about this. Um, and I really wanted to create these shapes. Um, and the main difference for, from this project to others that I've done is that I always start with the style frames, right? Because that's mm -hmm. what I'm, I'm more passionate about. Is how things are going to look and, and the mood and all the stuff. But at this time, I had to animate. So I was like, eh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't go that crazy with the style frames. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's been a while, you know. <laughs> Gotta keep those things, so uh, you're saying normally it's somebody else's problem because you could just hand off a crazy style frame. But this time you actually have to be responsible for animating it. So you're like, you know what, let me, let me yeah. down a little. <laughs> yeah, so this time... Uh, I actually started by the other way around, which is I started by doing uh, tests in Cine4D. Uh, mm -hmm. And only then I started to like the development. I had a basic idea of what I wanted. Um, so then I was just doing like a little, uh, I was trying to make my life simple in Cine4D. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so this is just most clients uh, animated and twisting. Uh, so yeah, I was like, I, I don't want to break stuff. Uh, so I was like, how can I make this? organic so i started exploring things i was like oh yeah it's getting somewhere you know it's uh -huh. good and i was sharing it with like, yeah, it's cool yeah so i was doing this the cell frames early, not as early on as i wish for but mm -hmm. i was doing a lot of motion exploration like how can i make things and um and i was actually having fun uh but i was trying to make it more like not super keyframe because i'm not that good I wish I was, I'm not. <laughs> so, so I was just trying to fake my way in. It's like, yeah, 
totally keep in all of this. Um, and right. yeah, I was using like X particles to do the corals instead of uh, modeling them. And I then I did the that. and then I did the comping as well. So uh, I, I did the comping, but then I sent it to Joyce because she was putting everything together. So she, mm -hmm. then she she made the, the top layer and on top of it to make sure that all of them have the same like particles floating and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then this second shot was actually uh, I wasn't supposed to be working on this, but then she asked me to help, and then I just did a quick test in X particles and having this because he went from mine to having this tunnel. Mm -hmm. uh, so it made sense in the way that I was doing it because it was part of my scene. So yeah, I had a lot of fun because it was like trying to go back to, oh, I was a motion designer when I started. I <laughs> you, come, you, you did the loop around, right? You came all the way back around. It's like, oh yeah, I could animate, right? That's what I was getting into. It's a hyper island. So I just wanted to point out like the final result looks again, very, very impressive. But as you break it down like this for our audience who might be looking at this and maybe are not familiar with the tools or the industry, as you can see, like, what uh, Nidia has done here is that it's just broken down. These are all tiny little pieces and she's utilizing things like procedural animation where you have one thing that's um, pretty much animating on its own based off of uh, either simulations or noise patterns, just black and white patterns. And then it's a lot of just scale, rotate and repeat, right? So a lot of this- <laughs> A lot of cloner. It's, it's a lot of cloners, a lot of just duplication and you know, that's very common in the motion design space. It's a very easy way to make things look very amazing, beautiful, and organic. Just duplicate, scale, rotate, and offset, right? Like those are kind of the, <laughs> those are the, the bread and butter of the motion design industry. When you animate something small and fun, just replicating it like this can have a fantastic result that we're seeing in this title sequence here. So, wow. This next project was for a shoe company called Reserva. They hired her to develop a looping animation around the idea of comfort. Let's see what she came up with. So this agency was like, kind of had this idea of having uh, a loop, uh, Instagram loop every month, uh, made by different artists. So every month would be a different artist, so a different loop. And they gave a different um, keyword for every artist. So mine was comfort, which I thought was a cool keyword at the beginning, but then I was like, I have no ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to represent comfort, the idea of comfort? Yeah, and the shoe had to be there. So I sent them a little deck with a, they asked for some ideas what I, what I wanted. And I was trying to think like, how can I show comfort? And it was supposed to only be one shoe as well in the scene. And I was actually traveling at the time I was in Montreal, uh, exploring the city. And I saw this bouncy castle with kids. I was like, oh, what if I do a bouncy castle? Because uh, I thought it's like, it's fun and it's, you know, it's comfortable, like the, the cushion part is playable. Uh, so then I, I sent that as one of the ideas and did a little mood board. And then um, they, they, they specifically wanted an um, environment as well. So this was part of that. They asked everyone to have some kind of environment in it. So I was just trying to get some mood board for myself of, what type of environment would I do um, as part of it? And as well, that would work for an inflatable castle uh, kind mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, so those, I sent this in another idea. They went for this. <laughs> Luckily, my husband uh, does know a few things. In, he, he works in Maya. So I was like, hey, I need your help. <laughs> <laughs> so he was doing the, uh, all the cloth simulation. Wow. Uh, in Maya. So he was, he was trying to figure out how to make them feel like the creases and all the stuff that we have on the mm -hmm. inflatable or balloons even. So as he was doing uh, this little test, uh, he explored it out for me and I try, I was just playing with um, uh, like how it should look. So I was getting reference from balloons and inflatable castles and uh, trying to just nail that look that I wanted. So I was having fun while he was doing all the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> as I was doing that, he was animating the shoe. So again, he did all the hard work. <laughs> so I was playing with the light and all this stuff. They sent me the, sh the shoe that was scanned and uh, I was just as well texturing it with the textures that they gave me, lighting it, uh, making sure that everything was the same. So mm -hmm. I was doing that part. And one part of the comfort was we had this insole. We had to show it to so making sure it looked uh, the same. So I was doing more like lighting, shading and texturing. Mm -hmm. uh, and as, to, as we were going through this, uh, that environment, I was trying like different colors on it. Like I wanted to do these blues and pinks and we wanted to have like this reaction. So when the shoe yeah. would uh, hit the floor, that's when the whole like cascading would happen. So that was like yeah. the reaction point uh, for us to like make sense. And because this was a loop, we needed to like inflate and then deflate back again. Um, mm -hmm. We sent this to the client and the client was like, good, but I was like, 
I don't like it. It's weird because it was really complicated to have a shoe being big because you had to have a specific size for like, because that's the product. Mm -hmm. But having this kind of realistic environment, but then it felt so out of proportion. So mm -hmm. I was like, I don't like it. So, so I change, I change it. Ooh, I, I like this a lot better. <laughs> so I sent to them, I was like, you know that one that you approved? Scrap that. I did another one, which was better. So and what did they say? What did they say when you, because I, you know, sometimes it's a, a little nerve wracking for some clients <clears throat> to go along this journey and they're expecting something and then you change it. What was their reaction when you showed them this? They, they were fine with it. They were, they were actually like, they were, I explained as well why, why I changed. I just didn't say, hey, <laughs> this stuff. I explained saying either, even if I did like some of the qualities of the other image, uh, it, it was wrong. It felt wrong, the, the scale. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to, to make it more like feel like it was kind of a right to scale and this way I also got more light into it just the other one I only had one window per se here I could have much more environment feeling to it in the sky and stuff like that um, so they said all good and I was like <laughs> love you guys um, wish everyone was like that uh, <laughs> so yeah so I was doing all uh, so I was building this and texturing it on all the stuff and my husband was then making sure that this new uh, environment wow. was uh, back into it. So it was just, and this was for timings that we're doing. We're just uh, checking the timings and if everything worked and looked correctly, this is the final one. Wow. That's so awesome. So, yeah. So, um, so yeah, again, kudos for my husband to actually do all the hard work. <laughs> so did he have to simulate all of that stuff? He turned it uh, all into cloth and inflated it? Yeah, so all uh, the um, the columns they are the same. Uh, we mm -hmm. just offset it and rotated them, um, mm -hmm. and but then everything else is. Um, I think everything that is similar, we will use it. Mm -hmm. uh, the stairs, for example, these stairs here, we will use them here uh, in terms of the cloth simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, so anything that was very similar, we will purpose because otherwise we'll just be uh, mad too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he uses Maya, and I use Nu for these, so would always have to get like his Alembic files to me and then I would buy like shading and making sure everything and rendering and lighting and all of that. Uh, but yeah, I had fun. I, I, I love working with my husband. Um, so that it was a fun project to do as a collaboration. Um, but yeah, I always felt bad. I look at him and it's like, you're doing all the hard work. <laughs> but did he have fun with it though? Yeah, he like, he's a rigger, but he likes Encroft and Maya. So, and so I'm like, hey, do you want to help me? <laughs> okay, I mean, that's, it sounds like you found a really good partner both in life and as a creative professional because, you know, some people really geek out about that stuff, some very technical stuff. I love partnering with those people too when I uh, work on projects and I'm creative directing. I love bringing on these very technical people because I feel like they fill in a, a gap in my brain that I don't have in terms of how to think or solve something, right? Like I have some kind of vision to figure out. Of course, it's really wild and crazy and maybe I could take it like 60% there with the tools and skills that I have, but I always need to hire somebody who's exceptionally good at what they do whether that be you know simulation or particles or whatever this is you know it's not very often that i meet a jack of all trades who's actually really talented at whatever she sinks her teeth into i found nidia to be a creative who's insatiably curious very hardworking yet humble at her core you know if you had one bit of advice for a young designer who sees your work and just wants to develop a great portfolio like you? Is there any advice that you would give to uh, our, our audience? Yeah, I think it's like some are very straightforward, which is work hard, stay humble. I think they're very important to stay humble in our industry. Um, and for me, it just everything flow naturally. Like I, I always had like goals to achieve. And once I got to them, I found another one. So I think you just keep doing the like, keep finding someone that you like and try reaching to their level, and, but on your own take. Um, and then just keep on finding someone else new that you like and, and just keep on like pushing yourself uh, because the fun part is going, looking back and seeing how much we evolved. And I, I always like to say that obviously like I've been in the industry for like nine years. So it's, if for someone they started looking out, I didn't start like this. Um, so definitely I didn't start out of like universe like oh i'm doing cool stuff uh, i thought it was cool now i look back and you're terrible so uh so <laughs> you're always going to evolve and you're always going to realize that what you're doing in the past it's not as cool as you thought it was uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that reminds me of my uh, high school art teacher. One thing that she told us the class all the time whenever we we're like rendering our sketches or anything like that, she always said, an artist is never finished. And, you know, that sticks with me today, like 20 years later, <laughs> uh, I still think about that an artist or a creative is never finished. And it's this constant process of evolution and growth and constantly challenging yourself. So uh, I'm glad you kind of share that perspective. And I, I wish that everybody would, would pick that up because there's no end of the road. It's all part of the journey and you want to constantly grow. Otherwise, you'll get really bored and then life would be very boring. <laughs> totally agree on that. Cool. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time anymore. So uh, as we wrap this, where's the best place for people to go find you? So my website is nitidias.com uh, and my handle is I'm nitidias. I am, not I am. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending your time, uh, your afternoon with, with me today or evening or morning, wherever you're at right now. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And uh, yeah, I, I hope to see you continue to grow and flourish and want to check in with you a couple of years, a couple of months from now, because I'm sure you're going to be making amazing work. Thanks. And thanks for inviting me. I had really great fun. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Nidia Diaz. If you have any questions about working in the motion design industry, leave us a comment below and we'll do our best to answer it. If you want to learn more about the art of creating beautiful style frames, consider taking my course where I teach you my process of designing dynamic images that tell powerful stories. I'll leave a link in the description below. That's it for us. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We'll see you in the future.